Good afternoon and welcome to the December board meeting of Johnson County Community College uh, Board of Trustees. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call and recognition of visitors, Ms. Schleist. This evening's visitors include Dick Carter, Roberta Eveslage, and Mike Fulton. Thank you. Awards and recognitions, Dr. Sopcic. Well, thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, we're going to make a slight change here in the agenda. And Dr. Weber, I'm going to um, let you go first here. We have some very special guests that we'd like to introduce who achieved a great deal. So. Yeah, well, thank you. Our guests uh, tonight that I brought in are standing in the back with uh, one caveat. I told them if they stood in the back, we'd let them take off so they could go study for finals. Yeah. <laughs> um, but with us tonight, we have our 2018 volleyball team. Um, and I want to say tonight we're recognizing the volleyball team for their season-ending accomplishment. The team competed in an incredibly competitive Jayhawk conference where four different teams were ranked in the top three in the country. They traveled to Highland and had to win on the road to secure the regional championship and a berth to the national tournament. In Charleston, West Virginia, the team took third place and received the trophy we're presenting them with tonight. So in addition to their team achievement, we also had three of our players earn All-American honors. They are sophomore setter Jade Askren, freshman libero Riley Barnum, and sophomore middle hitter Anna Hester. And, and uh, Trustee Cook, before you present them with the trophy, one thing I have to say about this team, and I told the coaches this, I don't know it, probably enough times they're here, tired of hearing it. Coach I is known for her defensive prowess, and her teams are always really tough. Um, but this year is as resilient of a team as I've ever seen them have. They repetitively, I'll go ahead and say, probably face teams with more collective talent than them. But they just had this refuse to lose. They were behind in games and matches that they came back on. And they were just an absolute treat to watch this year. So congratulations, ladies. Oh, Coach Eyes, please step up to the podium. Um, thank you guys for having us. Thank you for supporting us. We greatly appreciate it. Um, this team has definitely been one that will be memorable for a long time. Um, so much achievement through them, but again, their perseverance through all the obstacles that they faced this year, every single one of them at some point in time was injured. So we were playing a lot of times, even with defensive players playing up at the net. And I mean, they never for once sat back. They just said, okay, what's next, coach? And that's the resilience that they had. So I'm super proud of them. And thank you for your support. of the trustees, congratulations and thank you. I, I had the chance to be exposed to a pretty good coach years ago, and his theme was never underestimate your opponent no matter who it is. Honor them with your best performance. And, and you have honored yourselves and uh, your team and the college with your best performance each and every day. So thank you very much. We appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck with your finals. Thank you. <laughs> Tonight, we have a very special guest with us, um, Dr. Michael Fulton, superintendent of Shawnee Mission School District. Um, before Mike, uh, Mike steps up to the podium, I'm going to, or Mike, go ahead. You step up to the podium. Yeah. Um, I want to read a few factoids about the Shawnee Mission School District. Uh, the district serves more than 27,000 students from 14 municipalities in Northeast Johnson County. It's consistently ranked among the finest school districts nationwide for its high student performance. Last spring, it graduated 1,800 students. All five high schools are recognized by U.S. News and World Report as among the top high schools in the country, and the district is ranked in the top 6% of school districts nationwide. In 2018, Shawnee Mission seniors earned a composite score, a composite ACT score of 23.8. The Kansas composite was 21.6, and the national composite was 20.8. Five students earned perfect scores. 
Um, they, and they're doing great work preparing students for successful careers in the 21st century through the Shawnee Mission Signature Programs. If you haven't seen their new signature building, it's worth the trip. It's fantastic. The new Career and Technical Campus will be opening in early 2019, and their students will be able to explore four career paths, law enforcement, firefighting, EMT, and the legal profession. Now, that's just a few of the highlights of the district. Let me share a little bit um, with you about uh, their new superintendent. Mike has his doctorate from St. Louis University, a master's from Illinois State University, and a bachelor's from Southwest Missouri State University. He began his career teaching grades five and six and later middle school, and obviously you survived. <laughs> Prior to becoming the superintendent in Shawnee Mission in July of this year, he served the Pattonville School District for 23 years, the last 11 as superintendent. He led Pattonville to be nationally recognized for diversity as well as academic performance. He received the Special School District's Special Ambassador Award in 2018, which is the highest recognition given by the SSD to a superintendent who demonstrated extraordinary commitment to students and staff. In 2014, he received the Missouri Superintendent of the Year Award, and in 2014, he received the Robert L. Pierce Award, the two highest awards given to K-12 superintendents in Missouri. But despite all those accolades, the most important thing is that he has already demonstrated great enthusiasm in partnering with Johnson County Community College to do whatever we can together to help our students succeed. Welcome, Dr. Mike Fulton. That's well, very kind. Thank you for inviting me here this evening. And on behalf of the Shawnee Mission Board of Education, our staff, parents, and of course, most importantly, our students, uh, thank you. And we're just so proud to be partners with Johnson County Community College to uh, not only build programs for students while they're in high school, but also as a great place for them to, to come and learn and get ready for their future after high school. I've been so impressed by Johnson County, by the collaboration that exists among the superintendents, and especially the community college, in working together to try to build the very best learning opportunities that we can for all students. And so I just want you to know that we're committed as a school district to continue that partnership. And on behalf of uh, all the superintendents in Johnson County, of course, they can do this for themselves and will, I know, but <laughs> we just want to thank you. Uh, it's, it's a great team, and right. with that, we'll do wonderful things for kids. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fulton, on behalf of the uh, Board of Trustees here at the college, uh, we want to present you with this timepiece and representing our partnership with the Shawnee Mission School District. Some, sometimes people say time is fleeting, and sometimes people say time is standing still, uh, but we really appreciate the time you've been here already since July and the time we'll have ahead of us you said the key word on behalf of students and to help students K through 12 as well as higher ed. So thank you for the partnership. Thank you for all you do and congratulations and welcome. Thank, thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is our open forum. The open forum is an agenda item in each regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers must register by completing the registration form to the open uh, form outside of the room, giving name, uh, city of residence, name of group he or she is representing the top, the topic in a brief one or two sentence summary of the presentation. Each registered speaker is allotted five minutes to speak behind the podium. If there are a significant number of registered speakers, the time will be reduced accordingly. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium, should be respectful and civil, and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. With that, we have one registered speaker tonight. Christopher Bergen, if you would approach the podium, please. State your name and address for the record, and uh, we're delighted you're here. Uh, Christopher Bergen, 8913 Riley Street, Old Park, Kansas, 66212. Uh, I'll keep my speech very brief. I was very honored to be able to speak before all of you uh, last week. I wish that was the speech that was being recorded, because that was really good. Uh, so, <laughs> man. It should be. Uh, so I'll just briefly summarize, since you've already heard uh, all of the points that I made last week, is that I believe as a student body that we are 
uh, against the tuition increase of $1. And I would like to point out that you know, a $1 increase is nothing to me uh, because you know, I'm a veteran in the Kansas Army National Guard, so my tuition is paid for, along with many other students that perhaps they come from Blue Valley areas or places where their parents pay for it. And so to us, uh, $1 is nothing. But I'm here to speak on behalf of our poor communities that go here. Uh, the International Club is one of the largest clubs, if not the largest in the school. And so for our uh, poor communities that I'm proud to represent, proud to fight for as a student senator here, I just want to speak on their behalf that a $1 increase would affect them dramatically. Uh, last week when I spoke, I brought up the point that even one of our own senators, she's a, a mother of uh, a couple kids, that a $1 tuition increase would affect her by she wouldn't be able to have the gas money to come here, so she'd have to miss classes. So I just wanted to reemphasize that point. And then my solution, or a better solution, to a tuition increase would be to find more productive ways for the school to, instead of increasing rates, finding ways to lower spending or lower um, other things that the school does. I know that, and again, I asked in my speech last week to please correct me if I'm wrong, and no one corrected me, so I'm going to uh, use this as a true statistic that 80% of the money that the school takes in goes into payroll. So I believe there would be a more productive way to put that money more towards students, student activities, and lowering tuition rates rather than just going into payroll. You know, for the students that really do need that financial assistance and help, we can put the money towards that way, be able to lower our rates. And there's also various um, ways, there's huge amounts of money that goes to various activities in schools, such as the Center for Student Sustainability, and many other various ways that, for example, the one I just quoted receives $400,000, and that's controlled by a very small amount of students. And that's just, and I'm not saying to cut that completely, obviously, but there are ways that, we, well, if it's $400,000 now, if that were to go, this is just a random number I'm throwing out, if that were to go to 300,000, and then you look at all the other different activities that don't help students directly, you know, finding small ways across the various ways that the school spends money, finding ways to lower that, and then being able to use that instead of raising tuition rates, and then looking at why raise them in the first place. Where is the spending increasing right now? And so that's just what I wanted to bring up and really encourage you to think about. I wanted to briefly say that because I know our, uh, our very great President Tiger over there. I'm very uh, proud to serve under him. Uh, everyone loves him. And so great, very great things about him. He's going to give uh, more detail about our position there. And I really do want to thank you so much for your time. And I'm very honored to be able to speak on behalf of all of you and behalf of all of our students as a student senator. I believe it's my, my responsibility and duty as, to speak on behalf of my constituents. I'm extremely proud to be able to fight for poor communities here at Johnson County Community College. And uh, with, with that, I yield the floor. Thanks, Thank you, Chris. Appreciate your comments. I'm confused. What Thanks. are you uh, talking about? Excuse me. We, we, that, that closes the open forum. We will discuss this more in the management meeting and after Tigers. But thanks, Chris. Okay. That closes the open forum. We in don't have interaction usually during open forum. Student Senate report, Mr. Tiger Harris-Webster. Yeah, and you, uh, you probably need to um, be sharp because look at the people that rely upon you and give you such great accolades. Yes, yeah. Well, it's always a pleasure to come to the board, so thank you for hearing me. I'm just going to have, I just have one document here. I'm just going to pass out to everyone. If you don't mind just taking sure. one and passing it down. All right. Well, I finished my last final this morning so I can breathe and enjoy life again. <laughs> so that's always a good thing. Um, but getting into our presentation. So we had one snow day uh, during our meeting, and so we only met twice since last time I, or Caleb actually represented me and uh, spoke to you. 
So not too much has been going on. We wrapped up, uh, we had photos of Santa, which I'll go over. Uh, we had a few budget allocations, JCC gives. Um, just want to talk briefly about the tuition raise and the student senate retreat. Uh, in those packets I passed out, I have questions and um, some information that I presented. And uh, so I'll just be interested to hear what the response is for that. But um, positive note, photos with Santa, fantastic event. You see our lovely mascot right there with Santa Claus himself. Served 220 and 271 people. A lot of people really enjoyed it. Um, so that was, that was a fantastic event. Love to interact with uh, just the overall culture. Uh, the budget request, so we had interior design uh, studios. So they have this um, symposium which they buy, they bid on a room and Ikea and a lot of other big furniture and designing uh, markets, they actually bid on rooms as well. Um, so this is, we're the only school to interact with this program and it was really fantastic opportunity for them. Done it for 32 years. Uh, so we were able to allocate $3,728 uh, for them to do that. Um, Inner Club, largest club on campus. Uh, they have events and parties that range from 80 to 100 people. Uh, so we got to help them with a club party that they did, where they actually had over 100 people that came. And uh, the Club City Tour, a lot of the international students uh, will just, they live close by and they just come straight to the school and so they don't get to interact with the culture of Kansas City. Uh, so they got to go actually downtown. Some of them have been here for a few years and haven't even gone town, downtown yet. So they got to experience uh, the beautiful Kansas City and just look at the World War I Museum and a few other sites. So we're proud to have been able to help them. We sit, we've spent um, about 48% of our budget so far and we have, uh, we have about 52% left. So we have about 20 grand uh, left in our account to allocate for students, which is just where we wanna be. So JCC gives. I'd uh, just like to say thank you so much to everyone that um, donated money for this. Uh, we were able to make sure everyone got a gift, and uh, so we're really happy. 130 gifts, we helped 48 individuals. Um, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, Angelina says thank you, special thank you to you for coming up and making sure that all those leftover ones got distributed. Uh, apparently she you know, went uphill at gunpoint to get people to give <laughs> gifts, and it was really helped us out a lot. So. I'm just proud to have been able to help the community. Um, I chose to just give you guys my, those packets that I made uh, just because, you know, during finals week, was this last week, we had finals this week, uh, there's just been a lot, of, a lot going on. So in trying to examine the numbers, I've looked at the annual budget reports from 2016, 2017, and 2018, 2019. Um, I'm no economic expert and no accountant, so I'm just wanting to put that out there. Uh, really, I ran to become a student senator to really inform or to build more unity, um, and I would love for a student senate just to have uh, good communication with the board and any way that we can help the board with, uh, I mean, you guys are going to vote on this tonight, so I don't know if that's, it's, if it's even possible to table such a matter. Um, but. You know, if we love, even if it gets voted in tonight, or if you guys table it, we have a retreat on the 16th. So I'd just like to formally invite anyone who would like to come speak to the uh, senators, help them understand the reasoning behind it. Um, and uh, so we just really wanna work on that unifying aspect. Uh, I've, I've included some questions in there that the exec board and I have. We've had the opportunity to meet with uh, several board members, um, met with Dr. Sobchak this last Friday, and so I feel like I have a fairly good grasp on where, uh, what the reasoning is for this tuition raise, and, um, but I still have a few questions and concerns, uh, which the rest of the exec board has shared with me as well. So, yeah, thank you. And yeah, just a retreat, so formal invitation um, to that, but thank you. Yeah. Tiger, thanks for your comments. I would just say that we are going to discuss this in the management meeting. As far as uh, education for the Student Senate, I, I believe that our administrative staff certainly stands available to visit with you. It doesn't have to you know, wait for a board action or not, but I, I would encourage that kind of dialogue to take place rather than have uh, trustees explain the budget process. So while yeah. we have committees that work very aggressively, uh, the management committee is one that really focuses in on, on the detail of our budget development process, 
but we do have kind of a five-year a plan and each year we update it but we'll talk more about that during our management and report today if you don't just one more thing i just want everyone to understand not trying to point any fingers or step on any toes here and i understand that past years things like this have been approved and student senate hasn't been as concerned or maybe they just didn't know about it and that was okay because they were focused on other things um, so in this action it's not accusing anyone of being left in the dark or anything we're just trying to open more uh, communications and just build stronger student leaders at the campus. Well, so. and I, I believe, uh, Tiger, you and, and your at least immediate predecessors over the last four or five years have really been effective at having a full Senate, engaging the Senate, and so I really applaud and appreciate the work you're doing to get engagement. So we'll, we'll work on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you go back to the slides? Pal what were the recommendations that you asked for? Oh, the, yes. Actually, I don't know. Can I go back? Well, let's uh, we'll 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 look at those. Uh, okay. So those those are the rates you have in your packet. And we'll address those when we get to management report. Would would it be possible just um, to table? Is it even is it even? We doable? will discuss it during our management report. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Can we get the time of the retreat and the location for Sunday. Just time of the retreat. I can. We haven't fully decided on the time. It's going to be in the afternoon. So I'll be able to send that to you guys as soon as we decide on that. But thank you. Great. Thanks, Tiger. Thank you. College lobbyist report, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this evening's report is a little bit lengthier in its printed form, and I know you know how to read, and so what I thought I would do is highlight a few points that I think um, should be brought to your attention. Uh, the, uh, the House had its leadership races on December 3rd, uh, earlier this month, and um, elected leadership. That's all contained in the report. I think it's, though, important to highlight who the Johnson County representatives and, and senators are in, in leadership. And so we have returning to the post of Speaker of the House, Ron Reichman Jr. Um, Brett Parker will serve as the Democrat agenda chair, and Jim Denning will continue to be the Senate majority leader. The Senate did not have um, leadership uh, races. They didn't have elections. There will be some shuffling in the committee chairmanship um, posts in the Senate. In fact, I reference in the uh, legislative update that there is a memo attached that outlines those new appointments, and I failed to do that, and so I will get that document to Terry Schlisch um, so that it can be sent out uh, to anybody who wants it. It simply just lists who the new, there's a lot of returning or the same um, committee chairs, but there are some uh, shuffling around of committee chairs in the Senate. Uh, I think it's also important to note that um, Senator Barbara Ballier just this week announced that she would serve her remaining two years uh, in the Senate as a, as a Democrat. And so that changes the numbers a little bit in the Senate. There will be 10 Democrats, 29 Republicans, and one independent. And that independent is John Dahl, and he uh, declared that independent status when he um, chose to run uh, for governor, as lieutenant governor, uh, with Greg Orman. Uh, we're still waiting for House uh, committee chairmanships uh, to come out. Uh, most importantly, we watch for appropriations House Education and House Higher Education Budget uh, Chairs. And so the, hopefully those will be coming out in the next uh, week or so. Some of the things that we'll be watching next year uh, in the legislative process, or at least that will be commanding a lot of the time and attention of um, folks in Topeka are the K-12 budget, obviously. Um, there, there will be a, a large tax policy discussion. Uh, there, there, was, there was a tax bill that uh, did not pass at the very end of the session last year. We think that will be returning, um, and, and there will be a large discussion about that very early on. And then um, Medicaid expansion will also be a big topic um, that will be discussed uh, in, in the legislature. But those aren't necessarily higher education related. Um, the things that we expect to see in higher ed, uh, we've talked a little bit about um, before and in the past, and, and we certainly think that they will be returning. Um, things like the statewide mill levy uh, will likely be discussed. Um, service area, um, service areas for community colleges and possibly even for state universities. Um, we certainly think that depending on how the uh, Board of Tax Appeals hearings go for some of the big box stores related to the dark store theory, um, property uh, valuation appeals, that will have an impact uh, on, on how we uh, look at the budget here at Johnson County Community College. And then finally, concurrent enrollment. Now, I know that Dr. Sopchik was in a meeting just yesterday because we chatted briefly, and, and I think he may have some additional details uh, about some of the items related to uh, either service areas and or the statewide mill levy. And so I'd, I'd just turn it over to him to kind of bring you up to speed. Thanks, Dick. 
Um, yesterday, the Council of Presidents met with Ali Devine, lobbyist for the Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, to talk about some things that may um, uh, surface during this year's session. At this time, there's so much um, anticipation and apprehension about what could go on in Topeka, so you you have to be attentive to everything because no one really knows exactly what could what could come up. Um, out of southeast Kansas, specifically Butler County, there could be a legislative initiative to implement a property tax cap for community colleges. Uh, they want to focus on um, how the revenue is being used with those tax funds and also um, how it can, they can limit its growth. So in other words, a, a tax cap. Um, one idea was, for example, was the local tax rate would be based on the percentage of enrollment uh, from the home or taxpaying county. Fact is, Butler County, as an example, has 28% of its students from Butler County. So that would make the, the difference of that, which would be what, 72% are from surrounding counties. Um, is that really a fair deal for the taxpayers in Butler County? This is the type of thing that people are going to be talking about. There's also a lot of questions um, that's going to be asked about community college athletics. Um, that uh, perhaps was inspired by the elimination of that Kansas athlete requirement for football being lifted. So there are a lot of folks out there who are curious about that and um, perhaps through legislation might kind of pursue some things. Um, there is talk about a $25 million proposal for additional community college funding. Um, there is also talk that should this money come through, it'll be used to buy down mill levies. So this is always out there. In other words, whatever funds we get would go toward buying down the mill levy. Uh, this would probably be well received in many communities across the state who believe they're, they're paying excessively through their, uh, through their property taxes. Uh, the regents appear to be lifting or appear to be considering the lifting of service areas for its six universities. This would be kind of a, a big change. Um, but yesterday they asked the community college presidents to send in uh, their points of view regarding service areas for community colleges. Um, the implication for this is significant for all of us should service areas go away. So it's now getting to that point where they're actually fielding inquiries. Um, I believe across the state of Kansas, 105 counties, only four of them have growing populations. Johnson County adds about 10,000 people a year. So where do you think all the schools would wanna set up shop? So this is gonna be something we'll keep our eyes on. Um, I was encouraged by the other presidents that there seemed to be a strong sentiment um, against um, eliminating service areas. And this is something that was relatively new over the past couple of years. So um, we'll see where it goes. We'll keep posted. We'll look to Dick for um, seeing what he can learn uh, in the halls of Topeka. But it could be a far more interesting year legislatively than we had anticipated. So thank you. So Dr. Sopcich is one example, and he brought up Butler Community College. 28% of their students are from Butler County, 62% either out state or out of the state or out of the country. Uh, one of the things that, that <clears throat> some of us have talked about is that in the service area sector, rather than have a statewide mill levy uh, to support community colleges, is for that service area to impose a mill levy upon those counties in which they serve. And I think in a number of colleges, they've community college service areas, they've chosen not to have a levy increase. Uh, and so there's a, there's a tuition charge out of the college area, but those tuition rates are all over the place, and many of them are, are very reduced prices because they want to grow enrollment. And so that's, that's the challenge we have in the state, and particularly with 101 counties not seeing population, population growth. So it's a real big challenge. Uh, I can see the frustration on those, those community colleges. <coughs> Trustee Snyder. Uh, Dr. Sopcich, uh, I, I was not aware that Regent schools had service territories. H how does that work and what would be the implications of it going away? Um, you know, Trustee Snyder, it's, it's hard to explain. Okay. And because, you can follow up with that. Because easy. you look at here, you got K-State, you got KU, but they cannot have freshmen and sophomores in their, in their schools. Okay. What you've got going on now in Southeast Kansas is that Wichita State is, is, is going after everybody. I mean, it's a, you know, they've acquired a current technical school now. Um, it's all about enrollment. As population declines, these schools lose enrollment more significantly than our, our smaller slide. Um, it's about survival. And so this is what's going on, and it's not going to, it's, it's going to intensify. And so by eliminating the service areas, we'll see. There's, there's rumor that Wichita State's trying to acquire a school in western Kansas. 
I mean, where does it stop? So you can imagine what this community college is out there for. We've had great partnerships with KU and K-State here with their, with their centers. Um, we trust we'll maintain that. <coughs> but once again, um, despite the fact that we do everything we believe the way we're supposed to be doing it, what happens um, across the state affects us as well. We get pulled into some of this stuff, and it's unfortunate. Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. President, wouldn't the uh, implication of a statewide mill levy be a tax increase? Right. And then uh, it seems to me that we set up, I mean, five, six years I've been doing this and you longer, the, the, the service areas are set up to provide efficiencies for the delivery uh, of the monies we're allocating for, for higher ed, right? It's, it's to prevent us from competing with one another, more or less, which would be right. inefficient. So that leads me to, if we go along with this uh, market-based management system, uh, where we let the market decide, that would mean that we could potentially uh, get students in some of these other areas. If we would want to start spending Johnson County money all over the state, you know, bring it on. I mean, I, I think we could outspend everybody. It, it seems to me folly, but I, I think that w we would be somewhat uniquely and well positioned if that were the case. Yeah, and absolutely. Absolutely. And I think perhaps maybe that's why an overwhelming majority of the pres presidents raised their hands uh, in opposition to the elimination of of service areas. Thank you for your work, thank you. Yeah. Greg, I don't remember the number, but I know that when I was active with the Overland Park Convention Visitors Bureau and with the Chamber, um, I believe the number was like 22 or 23 four-year schools, universities in Johnson County operating, and that was years ago. That number may be wrong, but the point is there are a lot of four-year schools with campuses within the county competing for, for Johnson County potential students. And so that's, that's been going on for some time, but it certainly uh, seems to be uh, exacerbating in terms of the uh, marketing approach to get more students. Because some of these community colleges are really uh, at risk of whether they're going to remain open very long with their enrollments. Any other uh, comments or questions for Mr. Carter or Dr. Sobchik? Thanks, uh, thanks Dick. Uh, Committee reports, the uh, audit report, uh, I just bring to your attention that the minutes of our last meeting are on pages one through five. Uh, those minutes were not prepared, of course, for our, our report in November, but you received that report, so we have no further report to give. Collegial steering uh, did not meet uh, in December, so we have no report there, and that takes us to Human Resources. Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Human Resource Committee met uh, 10 a.m. on Monday, December 3rd, in the uh, Robert Lytle Conference Room. Uh, Trustee Lawson, uh, Vice President Larson, uh, Becky St. Levere, Chris Gray, a host of other people. I'm always amazed at everyone who goes. So if I forget anybody, <laughs> thank you for being there. Ms. St. Levere gave us a, uh, a review of the fiscal year 2018 annual report for HR, sharing headcount trends and uh, staff demographics. Uh, also shared were HR initiatives for the fiscal year 19. Uh, Ms. Uh, excuse me, Vice President Martley, Continuing Ed and Organizational Development uh, updated us on the recognition awards programs going on in the college, the process uh, of improvements and key elements for a successful program in uh, the fiscal year 2019 were discussed. And she also provided a demonstration of the new blog site uh, for us to know about. Uh, Ms. Marley also reviewed the employee engagement status of the 2017 survey with employees, the process uh, of improvement being used to develop the implementation plan included best practices, propo proposed priorities, and the 2017 to 2020 key performance indicators, KPIs, which I've come to know them as KPIs, but somebody said I shouldn't use KPIs, so KPIs. A recommended timeline was also shared by uh, Vice President Martley. Uh, Ms. Chandler reviewed the results uh, of the stay interviews for employees hired in the first quarter and exit interviews for the third quarter of 2018. The next Human Resources Committee meeting will be in February, uh, February 4th, 2019 at 10 a.m. in the Lytle Conference Room. And I just want to say in my time uh, on the HR Committee, I, I really appreciate the work that goes into er everything that we do, uh, the work that we do to churn and uh, metrics that we create to know what's going on. I, I really appreciate it and it's helpful to know uh, what's going on and uh, the work that we do for stay interviews and exit interviews and, and to be able to have some pulse on, on our employees is helpful. So, Mr. Chair, unless uh, Trustee Lawson has anything to add, that 
that would conclude my report. Okay. Questions or comments? Very good. I just ask, how often do we do the employee engagement survey? We're, our next, it would be every two years. I, and that's what I was thinking, but thank you for that confirmation. Okay. Oh, also, Mr. Chair, finally, one final piece. The, the working agenda uh, is on uh, page seven of your board packet for the Human Resources Committee. If anybody, I'm always amazed at who watches, uh, isn't interested, it's there on page seven of the board packet. So. Thank you, Trustee Cross. Thank you. Learning quality, Trustee Lawson. Yes, thank you. Um, the minutes really highlighted a lot of the presentations, uh, so I won't need to go over those. Those are on page eight through 10 of the board packet. And again, the working agenda is on page 11. Uh, one thing that really I'd like to highlight is I know that we have seen some struggles with our career tech, but I also see it as a pathway to retain people uh, for better opportunities. This means many of our best potential candidates to take advantages of our career tech program are not just high schoolers, but working adults hoping to change careers. I hope that moving forward we can look at ways to increase opportunities for adults seeking on ongoing education in the forms of programs that run at night so they could have better access. Uh, and so also, again, my time on the Learning Quality Committee, I've learned a lot about the college. It's been a wonderful opportunity to be the chair of that. And I'm very grateful for the work of Dr. McLeod, Dr. Weber, and Mrs. Martley, um, and Dr. Larson as well, and Dr. Sobchak for participating um, in bringing the information through the Learning Quality and the time uh, with um, tr Dr. Trustee Goosel. That's, wow. actor. <laughs> That's actually <laughs> accurate. <laughs> and Trustee Snyder. So I'll turn it over to the other trustees if they have anything further to add. I'll just say on, on learning quality, uh, hearing Dean Fort talk a little bit more about what we're gonna do in our new buildings is, it was exciting and critically important that we fill those buildings up with students for credit and with continuing ed students um, so that we get the biggest bang for our buck out of what are gonna be incredible facilities. Looking forward to it. Thank you, and thank you Trustee Lawson. Next item is the management report. I need to say that Trustee Lindstrom uh, feels badly he's not here. Uh, he said he could call in tonight, but this is uh, alumni night for uh, the team that he used to play for. And I think they, I think they uh, have a little something going on out there tonight. I don't know what it's all about. But he's uh, tied up all day with alumni activities and, uh, and uh, he regrets he couldn't be here. But uh, we are in the good hands of Trustee Musil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the management committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, December 5th here in the boardroom, and the report is on page 12 through 28 of the board packet. Trustee Lindstrom, Trustee Snyder, and I were in attendance for that. We received several presentations from staff. Uh, Dr. Vince Miller, uh, Dean of Academic Support, Jack Harwell from the Small Business Development Center, and James Hopper, Professor of Web Debe Development and Digital Media, presented a report on the Student Agency Project, which is a collaboration between the the CoLab, our collaboration uh, laboratory, the Small Business Development Center faculty, our Career Development Center, and the foundation to provide opportunity for students to work with businesses, uh, small business owners, and expand on their real life experiences as part of their program. Um, we did have some discussion about that and some concerns were raised. It's a new program. Um, it's a great opportunity for students to get some practical experience and probably has some, some kinks and tweaks that need to be worked out. Um, uh, Dr. Larson presented information on the agreement between the CoLab and external clients that would be used for such student agency arrangements. That information can be found in the consent agenda at page 48. Uh, Rachel Lears, our Associate Vice President of Financial Services, reported that the 2018 tax levy rates have been published by the County Clerk's Office. The college's final rate, uh, levy rate for the general fund is 8.731, and the capital outlay fund is 0 0.501. Uh, special assessments are 0.034, so our total mill levy is 9.266, um, lowered from last year, but a little higher than what we had estimated before the treasurer uh, finished uh, his calculations. Total valuation in Johnson County is about $10.5 billion. Um, the proposed 2019 and 20 calendar and budget guidelines were presented, and I'll read the recommendations for those shortly, and I think there will be discussion on those. Um, Rachel also reviewed materials relative to the five-year financial projection model. At the November meeting, uh, the committee reviewed the five-year model prepared by staff that assumed property values would keep rising each year, uh, although by a smaller increase than the last couple of years. Um, and financial services staff also created and presented at the meeting a, an alternative model 
showing assessed valuations staying flat and then declining actually for two consecutive years to test um, what our finances would look like in the event of an economic downturn. Uh, property taxes represent 65% of our operating revenues and the alternative model showed that if we have a downturn in assessed valuation as estimated in that model, we would end up spending $16 million out of reserve in the fifth year of the model, school year 22-23. Um, Janelle Vogler, Associate Vice President for Business Services, presented the single source report as well as a summary of awarded bids between fifty dollars and $150,000. That summary is on page 18 and 19. Uh, Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President of Campus Services and Facility Planning, gave his monthly update on capital infrastructure programs. This report is on page 22. He reported on the construction projects on campus as part of the facility's master plan. That report is on page 23. Uh, the management committee has three recommendations for action. I'm going to take them slightly out of order and leave the budget guidelines, which include the tuition issue, for the third one. So I'm going to skip to the, um, the recommendation uh, regarding business monitoring business services, a bid, and RFP recommendations. The first one is a recommendation uh, for student engagement tracking systems, and it is a recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of college administration to approve the renewal of Enter Engineerica Systems, Inc. at $105,000 for the first option year and $315,000 for the remaining three-year options for a total expenditure not to exceed $420,000, and I'll make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Trustee Cross seconds. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The next request for proposal is for the annual contract for window washing services. Uh, it is a recommendation of the management committee that the board accept the recommendation of college administration to approve the proposal from Jack and Joe's Window Cleaning, Inc., doing business as Squeegee Squad for window washing services at $65,935 for the base year and a total expenditure not to exceed $343,128.39 for the base year plus all option years. And I'll make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Squeegee what? <laughs> Squeegee squad. Any, Squeegee squad. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. First mention of squeegee in my seven years on the <laughs> Um, our last recommendation has to do with the annual adoption of bud budget guidelines that we do in December so that the staff and all of the budget administrators throughout campus can then go forward and put together a budget with some understanding of what the Board of Trustees wants them to do for the year. Um, those are The budget guidelines are found on, the budget cycle is found on page 14, 15 of your board packet and it demonstrates to the public, I think, that we start this on September 25th and we end it on August 20th of 2019 with a public hearing to adopt the budget um, with many, many steps in between, including review by the Board of Trustees and a budget workshop in April, um, an act, management, act, management budget acted on in May, um, publication in July, and then a public hearing in August uh, to actually set the budget. The budget guidelines recommended on page 16 and 17 of the board packet and I know there, there are, one of those budget guidelines is to increase tuition by $1 per credit hour for Johnson County resident students. That would go from $93 to $94 a credit hour. An increase of $2 a credit hour for in-state students not living in Johnson County. That would go from $110 to $112. And a $3 credit hour for out-of-state students, which would include our international students, uh, going from $220 to $223 per hour and the metro rate, which is for areas in Missouri of certain zip codes that are adjacent to Johnson County and I think in Wyandotte County even to allow those <coughs> individuals to pay something less than out of state, that would go from $135 to $138. Um, our, our, but our tuition and fees have stayed the same for three consecutive years, which is uh, something to be proud of, I think, and something I don't know of other colleges or universities in the United States that can say that. The metro rate has not been increased from 135 since we instituted it. I don't know if that's three years or two years ago. I think uh, we're yeah. in the third year. We're in the third we're year. In the third year. Uh, yes. So it has also uh, remained flat. Um, in addition, 
the, the gui budget guidelines, just I think so, so that I think everybody in the room probably knows, so the public public knows, um, we we want to we want to maintain certain cash balances according to our policies. Um, we have assumed a valuation increase in assessed valuation in Johnson County of four percent, uh, which is lower than the last three years, I believe, and is a conser relatively conservative number. We believe, based on what the county appraiser has. Uh, forecast for the January 1 values that will come out in March. Uh, it reflects a 2% reduction in the amount of credit hours that would be enrolled during the school year. Uh, it, I told about the tuition cost increase. It assumes that state aid would remain flat. As we know from the percentages in our budget book, state aid has remained flat or decreased over the last seven or eight years and is a decreasing percentage of our general revenues. We're assuming it will not grow for this year. Uh, salaries and benefits, the number of full-time and part-time positions will not increase. Um, and an average salary of increase of 3.0% will be budgeted pursuant to the master agreement with our full-time faculty, which we had also adopted for our administration staff and adjunct faculty. Um, staff will recommend operating budget priorities based on the two pr prior budget years. Um, we have capital budgets that include a $10 million allocation to support projects identified in the facilities master plan, which would include, um, I assume that includes paying down some of the bond debt. No, these would be, that is an obligation from the general fund directly to yeah. those construction projects. To contribute to the construction right. projects, right. both CTE, and, finance, and phase, uh, phase two, the athletic fans, development. All, all the ongoing projects. Mm -hmm. uh, million for continued work on active learning classrooms as we renovate classrooms and 3.5 million for other capital needs. Um, the budget would include 1.9 million for pr principal and interest due on the $50 million series 2017 certificates of participation, which are effectively similar to bonds that we borrowed for our, our uh, construction projects. And then we have a capital outlay fund that is also reflected in the budget guidelines. Um, I think I will start by discussing what uh, chairman of the Management Committee, Chairman Lindstrom, had suggested so that it's on the table. With Greg, before you do that, let me just uh, say this. I'd like to remind the board, and in respect to uh, a student senator that spoke and uh, Mr. Harris-Webster, the student senate president, uh, our discussion is among uh, board members and administrative staff, and that this meeting is in public, but we, we uh, will not engage them for input at this point, but it's among us. You've heard from them and you've heard his statement, so I would like to remind us that our discussion is among us. If I can, I also thought that Rachel was going to present to the whole board oh. what she presented the other day. Right. So that would be that an would opportunity be awesome. that would, that would go be after that. Perfect. Yeah. Rachel, please. Just shut up earlier. <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we wanted to take this opportunity to share with the full board um, the presentation that the management committee saw last week because it does provide the details um, behind the various um, factors that are considered by the administration when recommending the tuition rates for the coming year. So hopefully this will give a little bit of additional information to inform the conversation um, here in a little bit. Um, start with your actual um, recommended rates for 19 and 20. Um, again, these would take place in the fall of 2019. I won't read them again, you just went through those. Um, accurately, and I think everyone is familiar um, with what has been uh, presented so far. Um, so from there, we'll go into, um, again, the various items that we consider when looking at, a, at making a recommendation for um, tuition rates. And the first thing is really the balance of our revenues. Where do our revenues come from in the college's general fund? So you've all seen this chart before. It's in our, our annual budget document. Um, this particular presentation uh, goes back 10 years. And what this seems to say is that, that coming out of the uh, recession with um, a three quarters mill increase in FY14 and significant increases in assessed valuation um, over that period of time that our ad valorem property tax revenue, which is in the blue area of the graph, has significantly grown as a percentage of our total revenue. It was budgeted to be 65% of our total revenue this year. Over the same period of time, the tuition revenue, which is in the green, has decreased as a percentage of total, going from at its highest 25 in FY12 
um, to what was budgeted um, at 21% for last year and 20% for this year. Now I do have the actual figures um, in FY18, the actual amount of tuition was 19% of our budget. And in this year, FY19, I think the, well, actually, that will be 18% of our budget. So we've continued to see that shrink as a percentage of the total. In the orange um, is our state revenue. And again, that has decreased um, over time. Yes. So, so what's happened here, obviously, is the responsibility has shifted from the state and the student to the local property uh, owner. Which is, you know, it, it's clear that's what that's what's happened. Yes, and at the management committee um, meeting last week, Trustee Snyder asked a good question. And if you will bear with me just a second, I wanted to open up this other slide. Um, you had asked about um, if that slide had a, a longer tail, if it, if it went back uh, pre-recession, and we looked at that over 20 years' time, for example, what would that what would that look like? Um, so again. Starting back in 2000, for example, you can see that the, the green, the tuition, where we are now is basically where we were before the recession at 19, 20% of the total revenue. Um, again, what has decreased primarily uh, is the state aid, which has gone down from 22 to 14%, gone down by, by about 8%, meaning that that has shifted, as you just said, to the ad valorem category. To and the it local shifted property. from the property owner back to the students during the height of the property devaluation. So when those property valuations went down um, and less money came in, the students were then asked to pick more of it up. Basically 10, 11, and 12, 13. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I thought that was a good question, and I think that is helpful to look at that uh, information over that longer period of time. Okay. Um, back to this presentation then. So again, um, considering the balance is, is important in this discussion, um, I think it's also important to note that when you're talking about total dollars in FY18, the total amount of dollars that we received from tuition revenue was slightly lower than we got in FY14. So again, we're, we're not seeing that grow as a percentage of the total. Okay, um, another thing that we looked at was our actual rates per credit hour. So we've, we've said several times that the college has held tuition rates flat for the past three um, academic years. Um, if you look back to 2009, uh, 2010, those years over on the left side of the chart, you can see very significant increases um, $6 per year in those first two years. So about an 8% annual increase in those first two years. I'd also like to share with you some of the increases from 09 to 13 for out of state on a credit hour basis. In, in 09, it was increased by $5. In 10, it was increased by $10. In 11, it was increased by $14. In 12, it was increased by $16. And in 13, it was increased by $8. Now, those are tuition increases. Yes. Those are the out-of-state ones. Out-of-state, right. Of. And this is the in-district rates, again. So, um, again, the recommendation to move this forward modestly over time is, you know, hoping that in future years you're not asking students to potentially absorb a five, six, seven dollar increase in one year's time if or when the next recession hits and we need to make up for some decreases potentially in property tax revenue. With yes, I can share those numbers. In 09 it was two dollars for in district, then four dollars, six dollars, and six dollars, and three dollars during the worst economic time since the depression. Those were the tuition increases for in district. And remarkably, our enrollment went up. Okay. Next chart, again, Kansas residents, so folks living in Kansas outside of Johnson County, those increases you've talked about um, specifically in these years, remaining flat for the last three. And then our out-of-state residents um, rates for the past 10 years are here. These are the significant, again, the $14, the $16, the $8 increases. Um, it's noted at the bottom, but not, not visible on the chart, the metro rate, again, which we talked about of $135 a credit hour, which was effective in the fall of 16. Okay. Um, let's see. The next thing that we um, considered and talked about at the management committee meeting 
last week was where our students come from. So um, we looked at last year, fiscal uh, 2018, 73% of our students were from Johnson County. So Johnson County residents, taxpayers, we generate 328,000 credit hours last year, about 240,000 of those were, were taken by Johnson County residents students. The orange is other Kansas or out district, the gray out of state, and then the metro rate is about 6% of our credit hour delivery uh, currently. Uh, yes, uh, that's across. What is the metro rate compared to where we were prior to the implementation of, of the metro rate? I mean, where, where is that population at since we implemented the metro rate? It was out of state, I believe. The metro. They were all just, in. Were all just right. considered to be out of state. I mean, my knowledge and memory, if, if it serves me right, is that that has increased. Like, we've grown that pie, oh, that okay. slice of the pie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd have to look back since fall of 16 to get those exactly, but it has grown. We set some real modest enrollment growth, of like four, six, eight percent the first year or two, and it was increasing by like 35, 40 percent. That serves. Thank you. Okay. Um, when you look at the, the revenues generated by those credit hours, again, because the county residents are paying lower rates, their percentage of revenue is slightly lower than their credit hour percentage. So again, if they're generating 73% of the credit hours, it's about 66% of the tuition revenue comes from in-county. And then you can see the other um, breakouts as well. Go back to the hours, Rachel. Uh -huh. So I guess, you know, Trustee Cross raises a good point in terms of the, uh, the metro rate. Um, even go back to the previous slide. Okay. And no, I, that wasn't the oh, one. this one? I, um, no, go back to the credit hour slide. Okay. So um, 6% is coming from the metro, but those 19,000 credit hours compared to the 55,000, does that tell us that out of state tend to be more full time and metro tend to be part time? Mm. There, was, there was a slide I thought before that that showed the number of students or the percent of revenue. And it just, it's not relevant necessarily, but I was just thinking, does that mean our metro students are part-time students as opposed to out-of-state being more full-time students? There's something to that, yeah. Uh, most of our out-of-state are full-time, um, and, and the local students. Are, I mean, I mean in total, work. we know that out of all of our students, about 70% are part-time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another um, interesting thing to look at, I think, when you're talking about tuition rates is comparing um, the college to the other community colleges in the state. And so we've done that on these next series of slides. These are the current year, 2018-19, in-district tuition and fee rates. So our rate of $93 is um, on the orange bar here. I actually like this presentation better, this high-low ranking. Um, because it does illustrate, again, that only Dodge City and Coffeyville currently have lower uh, in district rates than our $93 per credit hour. And Rachel, where do we sit with regard to the rest of the country tuition? <clears throat> um, that information is would be similar to what's in our annual budget book. So we look at the, the college board administers a survey every year of two-year colleges and the state of Kansas is I think 46th out of 50 states as far as um, affordability, most affordable, least expensive. Least expensive, right. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, did, you, did you have a question? No, no? we're good. Okay. One other thing I wanted to point out here is we looked at uh, Metropolitan Community College, and this information is also in our annual budget book. Their current in district rate is $103 per credit hour compared to the 93 rate that we currently have in place. Okay. Um, the, the community college rates for Kansas residents, so again, folks living outside of your county, this, the college's rate of 110, I think, compares um, along with the averages of those. Our non-resident rate of 220 is considerably higher than most, although I understand there are a variety of factors that go into the ways that these schools set out-of-state um, non-resident tuition rates, including any tuition and scholarship strategies that they may have in place for student athletes. So again, this isn't you know, necessarily the greatest or the most applicable comparison is kind of there for information. And then border state, for the folks that have a border state rate similar to our metro rate, they don't, we use the out-of-district rate. Um, and again, you can see the comparisons there. 
Okay, course fees um, are also an important um, thing to consider. Many of our classes do have materials fees um, that are associated with materials that students may be required um, to purchase to complete the course, but this is the complete list of the course fees um, that are uh, required. Um, these are not per credit hour, these are just per course. They um, primarily, as we've discussed before, relate to private music lessons and also our railroad programs um, with a few, um, a few fees in the floral and horticulture classes as well. So we've typically not gone the route of assigning a course-related fee to a course that may be perceived as higher cost to deliver. Um, in comparison, that's that's not like um, a lot of other schools. A lot of places you look at their website or flip through their, their catalogs and they're going to have you know, pages and pages of course related fees. Um, so we just selected a couple of other institutions and looked at things like nursing or culinary, um, even biology, science lab fees, for example, um, to show you know, that just, again, some examples of fees that you may find at other institutions that you will not find. Um, Uh, we looked at Pell Grants and um, wanted to consider the maximum amount of Pell um, that is um, able to be awarded to a student. And we looked at that over a five-year period of time, and you can see how that has increased in the blue line on the chart. Um, the college's average is in the gray. You can see that's slightly increased over this time period and did increase um, significantly from 17 into 18. And we talked about that at the management committee meeting, how that relates to awarding the ability to award Pell year round, so including a summer semester, um, in addition to the traditional fall and spring. And so financial aid did go up for students who are getting Pell. Eligibility, did, yeah. So we used to have year round Pell. It went away prior to you know, 13, 14, and then we reinstituted it so students so could get what we call a second Pell award in a year. Um, looking at the recommended rates as not only um, a one, two, or three dollar increase, but also as a percentage, I think is also something um, that's important to consider when we're looking at the proposed rates for 2019 compared to the current rates for 2020. A one dollar increase, for example, for an in-county resident is a 1.1 percent increase. Again, when you think back to some of those increases that were in 2008, 2009, 2010, those were eight percent a year. This is one percent a year, and really for the first time in three years. So the average, um, or the five, excuse me, the five-year rate increase, ninety-one versus ninety-four dollars, for example, in that in-county rate, it's a three point three percent increase over five years. And then we've done the kind of just done the calculations also for um, the resident uh, and out-of-state rates as well. And again, when we're talking about um, dollars. Um, as I mentioned, about 70% of our students are part-time, and the average in the fall of 18, I think the average load is 7.6 credit hours. Um, so $7.60 then would be, you know, an approximate actual cost increase for a semester for a student in district. Uh, the budgetary impact of the tuition increase, we talked about this. This would generate approximately $460,000 of revenue in the college's general fund based on the recommended rates. Um, there are no recommended increases to any of the mandatory fees, so things like our student activity fee, the debt reduction, parking and roads, or sustainability fee, those haven't increased for a number of years. Um, there are also no recommended increases for any of the course fees that we talked about. Um, Next steps, we talked about this again um, at the management committee meeting. They um, wanted to move this forward to the board. We wanted to go through the presentation again to provide you with some additional information, some additional context. Um, I guess with that, I'd say if you have any additional questions and then refer it back. Stay um, there because we Musel. might need you. So uh, I interrupted Trustee Musil. Let's go back to you before we open up discussion. Well, I, I didn't, the, the one thing that I, I wanted to make sure that the full board was aware of was a suggestion that that, Dr. that Trustee Lindstrom had, um, which was that if we were going to consider something, he would he would ask for us to consider freezing Johnson County in district rates, but not but accepting the recommendation on the rest of them. I simply say that because I think it's fair that Trustee Lindstrom's thoughts that he expressed at the management committee 
uh, be expressed here, and I'm interested in hearing discussion from the board. The uh, Barbara, if you and Rachel could uh, review with us again the significance of, uh, and, and I and I refer back to uh, Mr. Harris Webster's comment about uh, having time for more input. We spend a lot of time, uh, as Trustee Musil has indicated, in the calendar mm -hmm. about the steps we go through. It's not just a one-year, but a five-year kind of projection. Talk a little bit, if you can, again, what's, what's happened up to this point from July 1 in terms of input, the work that goes into the budget process, and then the, the reason it's important tonight to consider uh, the guidelines as we move in to talk a little bit about that, if you would. Certainly, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, it, there is an early, generally an early discussion among the president's cabinet about um, formulating some guidelines. So there's been discussion by college leadership. Um, we actually start the budget process in October by giving detailed information to the roughly 120 budget administrators for them to begin thinking about next year. And some aspects of the budget process actually are due um, really before uh, this meeting. For instance, a process we call the remodeling request, where people are asking for physical changes to spaces to improve the functionality or to better serve students. That's already been due. But probably the most important date in terms of the um, participative process that we have is January 17th. So that's coming up, and that's for all budget administrators to really, it's, we call it our budget kickoff, when they hear about the adopted budget guidelines from the Board of Trustees to set the stage for their uh, work in moving the budget forward um, through the spring months. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Paul, Trustee Snyder. Uh, Dr. Larson, I guess in response to that, um, I mean, you heard Tiger's request. W would it be workable if we approved everything but item number four, which dealing with the tuition that's roughly $460,000. What, what, I mean, your honest assessment of, I think we meet on the 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th, sometime with that. And, and just curious what impact that would have. I think it, it probably affects the uh, folks in Dr. Weber's uh, branch more so than, than ours, but I mean, we've talked, it's, it's important to know what the tuition rates are to begin to publicize those and package them. I think that being said, could the tuition be delayed um, a, a month and move forward with others? Um, is that possible? Yes. And thank you for bringing that up. I had forgotten that that's, that's really the more critical part is getting that built into our, our catalogs and knowing, you know, what rates we're going to offer. Right. Other discussion? Trustee Lawson. Um, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, so I wanted to go over. You were talking about inflation, and so the student tuition increase is there to buffer. If What was that that you mentioned? I don't believe I... During the recession, I think that. tuition went up because right. that property values went down. That's what you said. Back at the beginning, is that? I thought there was some discussion mm -hmm. about inflation and being able to, buff, like increasing. I think you were mentioning three, six. I think it was a recession. Trying to, trying to, I guess, buffer the significance of that increase. Again, back when we did this, it, the increases. This is a one dollar increase on a little bit larger base. Back then, it was a $2, a $4, a $6, a $6, and a $3 increase, back when unemployment was, uh, was rampant. So that's the challenge, something that we're trying to watch out for, rather than hit the students with these types of significant increases all at once. The projections are there will be a recession. You know, it's a very predictable, it's a reasonably predictable cycle. So that's one of the things that this is trying to do, is to have some type of design on the best way to deal with tuition. Okay, so we don't find ourselves in this situation. And during the same period, by the way, we spent $28 million out of reserves. At the same time, we increased tuition at that level. So that's what was going on here, and we're trying to prevent us from being in that type of situation again. 
Okay, because I'm, I'm trying to understand, because the Federal Reserve on their higher education price index specifically says that when colleges increase their tuition, it's a factor of inflation, and it starts to really impact that. So, but that, we, am I correct to say that you're not talking about inflation? Well, I think the, what is the point, the 1% increase is below the inflation rate, mm -hmm. and it's not going to, it may have an adverse effect on those numbers when they calculate okay. inflation. So then that was understanding. Thank you. Um, I do have some other questions. Um, so is there a project that this money is going towards the $1, the $2, and $3? There's a specific project? It's, this is a part of the, of the general fund. So it goes in with the state money, with the ad valorem, it goes into the into the whole budget. We don't really raise tuition or increase the mill levy with a specific project in mind. Okay. Um, do we have any study on why the one dollar versus five dollars versus fifty cents? I think when you look, I know some people think this is arbitrary, but when you look at all the data and the facts that collected, you know, by by Rachel's team and Barbara's team, um, a lot of work goes into this. Raising tuition is a big deal. That's why we haven't done it in three years which is exemplary, which is kind of remarkable. But in this case, when you start looking at all these, you know, all the data and, and think of the future, because this is as much about the future. I mean, Tiger and Chris did an incredible job up here laying their case out, outstanding presentations. And they represent students today. We're looking at students in five years down the road when tuition will be equally as critical and where could we be if economic hard times, economic hardships hit us. And am I right to say that the data that is being presented is data from us, or is this national data that's coming to us, national studies? What, I mean, what is data? It's we, primarily data from us. Although we, called, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Although we've, we've also shared, for instance, as, as Rachel mentioned, I think we're six from the bottom. The state of Kansas is six from the bottom in terms of the average two-year higher education cost. So we have some national data on that as well. Okay. And then I've heard a lot of talk about the problem that's being addressed, and I just kind of wanted to know what is the general sum up of what is the problem that we're addressing by raising it $1 and $2 and $3? What I, are we addressing? I, I was just, I, I think I, what you're hearing, what we're talking about is the balance that we've got, or the imbalance, if you will, between our sources of revenue and the general fund, which is best illustrated by this chart. You know, how as a percentage of our revenue, um, the property tax revenue has grown so significantly to now represent almost 65% of the total, and then the shrinking um, portions from tuition and from state aid. I think that <coughs> this is my ninth year on the board. I have two more questions. This, Mr. this Mr. is Chair. my ninth year on the board, and to give a follow up on that balance, uh, we had talked years ago about uh, the balance being 25% tuition, 25% state aid, and 50% local property tax. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that was kind of what we were thinking of. And uh, you can see how that's changed over the years. Go ahead, Trustee Lawson. Thank you. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this proposal? Um, approaching it modestly over time, I think, as we've said, it, it hopefully will prohibit a more significant increase on, on students in the future. The amount of revenue, I mean, it's not like $460,000, you know, it isn't, it's not a significant dollar amount when you're talking in terms of a $153 million general fund budget, but it's more, again, of that gradual approach over time at trying to maintain the balance that we, that we have and to not have it further erode. Final question, if it is so minor, why are we doing this? Well, as if what? As if it Rachel is so just, minor and it's not making too much of an impact right now, why are we doing this? When the student senate president clearly said that there are students that are impacted based on the gas to get here, so I'm asking why are we doing this then? I, I'll and take I, that. Okay. As Rachel stated earlier, we're doing this in one way to address this balance. The other way is to make it. Um, I don't want to buffer or to cushion the day when tuition will be increased at $5 a credit hour or $4 or $6 like what we've done in the past. Um, if you think there's resistance, this resistance to $1, then I can imagine what Tiger and Chris back there would do if the recommendation was to raise it $6 a credit hour. So that's, that, that's, why, we're, that's why we're doing it now. I, I'd also add in terms of this proportionality discussion with property tax now representing 65% of our revenues. I'm looking back at this history during the recession, assessed valuations in Johnson County dropped 
3% and then 5.4%. So when we experience that again, it's now hitting an even larger portion of our budget. So that's what, when we talk about modeling, I'm not going to say doomsday scenarios, but the stress test scenario, when we do have a downturn in assessed valuation, that's when we start seeing that use of reserves over an extended period of time that is concerning to us. Oh, Mr. Chair, I'd like it noted I strenuously oppose this rate um, increase, especially on the Johnson County residents. I believe we just rewarded our residents um, by reducing the mill levy, and now we are risking breaking our promise to those same residents by picking their pockets when they send their young students to our programs. We cannot give with one hand and take right back with the other. I am hopeful we can have a longer discussion about how we arrived to this formula for the increases. Mm -hmm after the college put out a video content with the Kansas City Star highlighting that we removed the track in order to prevent student increases, and now we are seemingly saying we were wrong. I think it's important to understand that what has changed and how we arrived at $1 increase and what specific expenditures this resolves, especially for Johnson County residents. Thank you. Trustee Snyder. Uh, I just wanted to mention I, I'm very comfortable with moving forward with this. I think uh, Rachel and Dr. Lawson and her team have put together a you know very compelling and, and thoughtful and, and comprehensive uh, view of all this. Uh, that said, um, and I'm comfortable whether we move forward or not, or, or not but in whatever case, uh, you know, Tiger has reached out and, and looked for an opportunity to engage more, so I want to make sure that, um, you know, we take advantage of his, his opportunity on the 16th, and, and if they come back, you know, obviously and, and, and have a case that would, would be counter to anything that we might approve tonight, uh, you know, there's certainly several months still in the budget process to, to hear that. Any other comments? Trustee uh, Cross. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, my life is always easier when I tell people thank you. <laughs> uh, I told Dr. Sobchak the week of Thanksgiving that I was thankful for his service and the competent nature in which uh, this college is run and the, the, the work of the staff I appreciate. I do ever disagree uh, with the reasonable conclusion and thoughtful and comprehensive presentation here tonight, I, I too cannot square the reduction of the mill levy and the increased reduction from 0.1 to 0.25, which we were told appraisals and property values would rise to be able to buffer any kind of need um, to do this very act. Uh, you know, it's my perception, certainly my family's anecdotal experience, that uh, the competitive advantage that we had in this this college but was by investing our resources to make us a no-brainer alternative for the area. You know, if we stay competitive with the market, we're going to be stuck with the pack, and I think we've got this exactly backwards. At some level, it makes sense to raise it, and I, I really do appreciate uh, keeping, and it, it is exemplary, I appreciate it, keeping tuition fees where they were for three years, and at some level, it makes sense. I just can't square it with a 0.25 decrease with the mill levy. Uh, I said it then and I say it now. We should have used our surplus and we should use the advantage that we have in this, this county to make the burden easier on our students. Uh, grow the College Promise program. Uh, I campaigned on that. Many of us campaigned on that last year and I think that uh, I think students on some level do need skin in the game. I think it's right and fair that they pay for something. Uh, I, I've, I've struggled with on this board appreciating the 13% that the state contributes, but yet also, as, as I think everyone knows in this room, appreciating being a contrarian, presenting the devil's advocate argument that uh, it's also disappointing that it's down from that 25% model. And someone needs to say it, so I'll say it. It's just disappointing. And not only for us, I mean, we're going to be okay here, but uh, with two parents from rural parts of Kansas and, and be, visiting some of the places in the rest of Kansas that are struggling way greater than we are. It's just disappointing that over the last decade, the state has chosen to decrease the amount of money they're contributing to higher ed. And wrapping up here, Mr. Chair, um, you know, further disappointing is the, the amount of full-time hires. We've frozen that again. Uh, I could be corrected, but in my memory, that's been a part of our budget guidelines for as long as I can remember. Uh, the the full-time faculty hires and, and positions are at an all-time low of 320. I know we're budgeted for three, 54 or th some some were higher, but we're stuck and mired at like 320, 325, and I wish that would be higher. 
So overall, I think we could better prepare for the non nonsensical competitive market that's going to be thrust upon us if we, uh, frankly, work to reduce the burden on our students and uh, <coughs> kept the mill levy where it was. That, that would if we'd kept the mill levy where we were and we'd come back with this or kept it at the point one that we talked about for a great length of time and then sprung it to point two five for reasons I don't fully understand, but uh, nevertheless, I, I disagree with this. Trustee Ingram. Um, I was actually prepared to vote against it when I walked in the door, but I appreciate your comments this evening, Rachel, and that's kind of helped me understand more. You know, it was all about where did this come from? You know, how, how did we arrive here? Um, but I do understand, um, I'm comfortable with moving forward just based on the information that I've heard tonight, so. Trustee Musil. Well, I purposely say my comments to the end because I, I think the, the broader principle here is that we have an obligation to balance our revenue sources at uh, those we control. Trustee Cross has pointed out, we don't control what the state does. It would be nice now when the state has a little bit of money if they would increase their support for community colleges and other higher education but they also have to expand Medicaid and pay for K-12 and do our prisons and take care of the, the kids in our child welfare, welfare system that are, are uh, in desperate need of more money. So I'm not counting on the state doing any more. The notion that last year we did something wrong by lowering the mill levy to, uh, to get to the same amount of money we were going to get to last December when we did our budget guidelines. We simply gave, let taxpayers keep money that we had said in December we don't need. And when we got to August, we said, we still don't need it. So we lowered the mill levy to only take the amount of money we said in December we needed. That's, that is prudent uh, fiscal policy in, in my mind. And even giving that back, we took in four or five million dollars of new money last year from property taxpayers that we didn't get in the year previous to that. <clears throat> and under this budget, we will take in four million dollars of new money from property taxpayers that we didn't get last year. And there's an old saying that it's don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the man behind the tree. Don't increase my tuition a dollar or two dollars or three dollars because we don't need it. We will get it from the taxpayers. And they've gone from 50, a low of 55% to a high of 65% supporting this college. And I, I did I actually try to do some math last night. Um, in the years from 2012 slash 2013, the low point of our budget issues, the increased valuation in Johnson County has gone up by over $3 billion, or 40%. Since when? Mr. Since 2012, 2013. Okay. The first year that assessed valuation grew after the recession. In that same period of time, the average home price in Johnson County went from 229 to 299. $70,000 or 31%. You have a higher value on your home, mill levy's the same, you pay more money. Our mill levy has increased 5% since that, the recession started to end. Uh, tuition and fees have gone up 11% during that time. Uh, but they've dropped from 25% of the general fund to 19% and they'll drop to 18% next year. Regardless of whether we adopt this or not, the amount of percent, the percentage of revenues we get from tuition is going to be lower because our overall budget's going up and we're getting 3.9 million new dollars from property taxpayers. Uh, we've already heard Kansas Community College tuition and fees rank 45th or 46th lowest in the country for 2007 and 2018. So we are not overpriced losing our competitive advantage because of tuition and fees. Either in Kansas, as we've seen, or in the metro compared to Kansas City, Kansas, or Metro Community College. Certainly not in response to KU or K-State that are $370 a credit hour and $309 a credit hour. <coughs> uh, property taxes on it. Average price home last year of two ninety nine two hundred ninety nine thousand. There was it, it was three hundred eighteen dollars that went to the college. That was eleven dollars more than the year before. If you assume a five percent increase this year, 
their tax, the value of, a, of the house will go to 313,950,000 and their taxes will go to $334.50 or an additional $16.50. It's easy to say, let somebody else pay it. If you look at a million dollar business, because businesses are assessed at 25%, not 11.5%. So they pay a higher tax levy than residences. Their taxes from 2017 to 2018 went up $53, and they would go up another $25 if we don't, if we keep the mill levy that's in here now. So everybody that's a property taxpayer, and students are property taxpayers. They pay when they, if they live with their parents, and their parents are paying property taxes in their mortgage. If they rent an apartment, their landlord is charging them <coughs> property taxes to recover that money. So let it, just think about basic economics. People are paying property taxes, including students that are trying to come here. <coughs> I, too, empathize with those students in need. We have Pell Grants, which pay tuition and other costs of going to school. If the average student is taking 7.6 hours and it's $7.60 of an increase per semester, that I can hypothesize some students that that's a problem for. It's not the problem that daycare is or that transportation is or that housing costs are. So it's not, it's not at the same level of those things that keep students from attending Johnson County Community College. Uh, why do we do it at all if it's such a small amount? When will we ever do it? If we don't do one dollar this year in a hundred and fifty three million dollar budget or hundred and fifty five million dollar budget, well next year we're not going to do a million because it's not worth it. So it's not worth it unless we do three or four or five dollars. That's when you get real money, as someone would say. That's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying not to force students to have a three or four or five dollar increase one year. And and that's something I fought against when I first got on this board. I'm famous for having suggested in a meeting that we set our tuition rates haphazardly. Um, wasn't the best choice of words, but we were jumping from three to six to eight to five. And, and my thought was we ought to give students the benefit of knowing there's some stability in our tuition rates. And if we go up $1 a year after three years of no increases, I think that's fair. And we're still going <coughs> to tell the property taxpayers of Johnson County, you're going to pay 66% of the cost of this college. So I, I'm, I, I share Paul's uh, thought. I don't care if we adopt it tonight. I do not want to um, underestimate the value of students having some input. And more importantly, I'm impressed you came and you cared enough to learn about it. Mm -hmm. Tiger and I met and we talked a lot about you know, the overall budget and what the balance is and who pays what and what does it go for. You know, we should never increase tuition and say it's going to go for X or Y. It goes for your faculty member. It goes for the lights on here. It goes for the heat. It goes for snow plowing. It goes for all the general fund things that make this college work. And, and that's what it ought to be. That's why it's called the general fund. Um, so with all of those things said, I'm, I've thought a lot about this because I, I think Trustee Lindstrom was trying to find a compromise that made sense, which was to benefit Johnson County students by freezing Johnson County and dropping the amount of overall increase to 260,000 or something instead of 460,000. Um, but I really, at the end of the day, don't think it's, it's too much to ask for students today and for students five years to, for now, as President Sopcich said, to do a $1 increase this year so that we don't have to jump it up. If the economic cycle turns down and uh, property values go down, the pressure is going to be a lot greater than what we feel today. Um, and that's the time we shouldn't be increasing taxes. That's why we build up reserves. And that's when we should avoid hitting students with that, with, with increased tuition. Um, so, and if we're, go if we're going to freeze Johnson County residents' tuition, which would save, which would cost, uh, cost us or reduce revenues by $200,000. Then I would recommend we, at the same time, reduce the mill levy in the guidelines by 0.1, which would cost us a million dollars 
in revenue we'd otherwise receive. And so instead of taking $4 million from Johnson County taxpayers, we'd only take $3 million. Because if we're going to balance this out and say one portion of this shouldn't have any increase, should be frozen, then we ought to give some relief for the others. And I strongly disagree with the notion that we rewarded taxpayers last year by giving them a 0.25 mil levy decrease. We took $4 million more from taxpayers, even with a 0.25 mil levy decrease. So if we keep all that in mind, I think it's fair. The recommendation that has been made is fair uh, and reasonable and will not hurt us either in a competitive standpoint. Final point, with respect to students in need, we need to target that. We don't need it across the board. When my daughters went here, they could afford the tuition, and if there was another dollar, I could pay it. If there are students out there, and they are, that need more in Pell Grants, more in grants, uh, a fund to fix their transmission so they can get here, more capacity at, at the child care center that they can afford daycare, more scholarship money, let's target it to that. Instead of an across the board thing, it seems really easy to just say, students, we're not going to increase your tuition even one dollar. Thank you uh, all for your passion, including our student speakers tonight. I uh, really want to thank the uh, staff for all of the detailed work you put into it. Reference has been made to the Pell Grant program, and I really appreciate our efforts to try and increase Pell Grant uh, application and distribution, because nationally we face a challenge that uh, a large amount of the Pell Grant money goes unused nationally. And you've got congressmen saying, why more money in Pell when you aren't using it the way it is intended to be used. And I know they've opened up that latitude to use it for other expenses rather than just, rather than just tuition. Uh, I, I believe uh, this college has, has its financial rating among the highest in the land due to the detailed uh, steps that go into building a budget with staff. And I, I, I echo Trustee Snyder's comments about uh, his, uh, his confidence and appreciation for the work that you do. So, so here we sit, uh, and I, I guess I would ask uh, uh, Mr. Musil if you're going to move that recommendation forward. Uh, we'll I will for purposes of discussion, certainly. Um, it is a recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board adopt the, accept the recommendation of College Administration to approve the preliminary budget guidelines, which include the tuition increases as previously indicated. Is there a second? Second. That's this one right here. Right. Yes. yes. We have a motion and a second, and that would include uh, around the discussion of a dollar increase for Johnson County residents and the increase for outstate, increase for metro, et cetera, accordingly. Any further discussion before we vote? Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So I think we have one, two, three, four, four, and two opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate it. I believe that concludes the management committee report, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 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 Trustee Snyder. I, I just had one point on the management committee report is just uh, if our minutes could be augmented to show that Chris Bergen did speak at the management committee, but we don't need to get into the context of everything, just brought up the issue or whatever. Thank you. Nominating committee, we appointed uh, Trustee Lindstrom and Trustee Ingram to come up with the nominations for our officers for 2019, and I'll turn that over to Trustee Ingram. Sure. Um, in Trustee Lindstrom's absence, I will uh, give the 2019 Board of Trustees <coughs> slate, and uh, then um, we'll just go from there. Anyway, officers um, would include Chairman uh, Jerry Cook, Vice Chairman Nancy Ingram, Treasurer Greg Musil, Secretary Dave Lindstrom. Uh, committees as follows will be management, um, Ingram Chair, Dave Lindstrom, Paul Snyder, Human Resources, Angelina Lawson Chair, Greg Musil, Learning Quality, Paul Snyder Chair, Dave Lindstrom, Audit Committee, Jerry Cook as Chair, Nancy Ingram on that committee, Collegial Steering, Jerry Cook as Chair, Nancy Ingram on that committee. And liaisons for the foundation, Greg Musil will chair uh, Lee Cross as a member. And Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, Angelina Lawson would serve as our liaison. And for Jay Cert, Lee Cross. 
and I would make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I would say that in some of these committees, the practice has been that the chair and the vice chair serve on the audit committee, for example, in collegial steering. Uh, so that's why they appear there frequently. And uh, with that, uh, any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We would like to thank everyone for their service on their committees and uh, for this past year. So thank you to all. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Treasurer's report, Trustee Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I understand, this is my final uh, treasurer's report. I'd like to thank the staff, particularly Rachel Beers, for preparing these and doing all the work that, that's involved. Uh, the board packet contains the treasurer's report for the month ended October 31st, 2018. And some items of note include uh, page one of the treasurer's report is the general post-secondary technical education fund summary. October was the fourth month of the college's 2018-19 fiscal year. An ad valorem tax distribution of $1.2 million was received from the county treasurer in October and distributed as follows. $1.16 million for the general fund, $65,101 for the capital outlay fund, and the special assessment fund received $4,409 for a total of $1,229,995. The college's unencumbered cash balance as of October 31st, 2018 in all funds was $87.6 million, which is approximately $3.9 million higher than at the same time last year. Expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits. Therefore, Mr. Chair, it is the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's Report for the month ended October 31st, 2018 subject to audit. We have a motion. Is there a second? We have a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Monthly report to the board. Thank you, Trustee Cross. Thank Monthly you. report to the board. Dr. Sopcich. Uh, thanks, um, Trustee Cook. Uh, first of all, I hope you've all had a chance to read the monthly report to the board. Um, it's about over 40 pages, one of the more voluminous ones, jam-packed with great insights into the activities across campus, some of the fine work that faculty and staff are doing uh, with our students. So please take the time to read this. Um, I, we're going to show a video. And uh, Chris, I'm going to um, set you up here. Could you give us a little setup for this video? It celebrates the 50th anniversary. Yeah, so uh, working with Caitlin Foundation, what we're looking to do for Summer Community Evening was, was really kick off the 50th celebration. What we're looking to do is obviously celebrate the past, but then more so look forward for the future as well. So it's a difficult thing is really kind of looking at all the things that built up and then where we're going from this standpoint. So we work with Kate and her group to really kind of try to put together and encapsulate, it, it, which is a tough to get in two minutes, of uh, really what Johnson County is and what we're looking towards for the future. And Chris, there's a lot of people are going to see a lot of footage here. Um, what are you going to be doing that throughout the for the rest of the year? Yeah, so throughout the year we're going to be having a committee, we've actually got a committee of three different groups on campus, and this is completely um, faculty and staff led to really come up with uh, different opportunities for not only students, but the community and for the college to, to engage and celebrate. So you'll see things from the staff picnic to trustee reunions to different celebrations with students across campus. So this will really set us up for that. Um, we're going to be launching a, a 50th anniversary website. We'll have a calendar of events that will then showcase those not only to the internal for our staff and faculty, but also publicly uh, to help share in that celebration. And, and we're looking forward to an exciting year. All right. This is Johnson County Community College. This is home to 50 years. of traditions. the support 
we get back from it. It's the forward thinking of our leadership and the passion of our board and trustees. Tomorrow lives at JCCC, and for 50 years, it's lived here because of you. That's terrific. Thanks to you and your team. And we're going to be seeing some of those uh, little clips in commercials and things, uh, YouTube, all of that, right? It's fantastic. Um, that also was a, a screen test for Tiger. Um, <laughs> look pretty good in there, Tiger. Congratulations. Um, speaking of which, Chris and Tiger, I want to thank you um, for what you did. Um, I've been here for some time, and we've never had a student discussion on anything of, of, like this, of this importance. So it's not easy to, to step up. Uh, you did a magnificent job. Um, please let us know what you need for your retreat. I mean, you know, we do have funds here um, for special cases. Um, there's a lot of opportunities we have to share information to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So again, thanks for stepping up. We really appreciate it. It bodes well for our students and for the school, so thank you. Um, with students like Tiger and Chris and the whole Student Senate, uh, we recently uh, were recognized um, by the Board of Regents, and I found out of this, out of this, um, or about this, uh, when another president uh, sent me an email and said, "Hey, congratulations to you guys. Um, we're number one in the state versus all community colleges when it comes to retention. In other words, our freshmen come back for their sophomore year. I mean, this is outstanding. It's, an, it's a great tribute to our faculty." Um, to our staff, the entire campus community, to get these students to come back. It's been an objective of, of ours. Uh, Dr. Weber's played a big role in this. I want to thank you. Um, Dr. McLeod as well. Everyone has been a part of this effort. Um, this metric is a KBR metric. It's based on a three-year average, including the cohorts that started in 2014, 2015, and 2016. Um, our three-year average is 63%. And that's outstanding. So, uh, so congratulations. Sixty-three, you said. Sixty-three percent. Yeah. Um, and so tonight, uh, as the clock moves toward the kickoff for the Chiefs, um, <laughs> but I know that you'd rather give up kickoff for another lightning round. So tonight we're going to feature Tom Pagano, our VP of Information Services and Chief Information Officer. John Clayton, Executive Director of Institutional Effectiveness, Research and Planning, and Chris Gray, Associate Vice President for Marketing and Communications. Tom, give us a little update, some of the cool things that you're doing. Please, a podium, absolutely. As I understand it, I have two to three minutes. You have two. <laughs> One and a half minutes. <laughs> I, uh, Omaha, Omaha. I'm, gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to set my timer, so I'm going to, uh, so in order to re, uh, meet that metric, Joe, I'm going to uh, uh, take a little different approach tonight. Normally, I explain uh, the update, I give the update, and then I have to explain what I said. I'm going to drop the second part tonight, so if you have questions, uh, hold them till after. So uh, I, would, uh, I would just, uh, uh, I know you've all been uh, really tired tonight, so I'm going to make this a quick audience participation. So how many of you have heard about the internet? <laughs> yes. How many of you have heard about the cloud? Okay. How many of you have heard about internet too? Okay. So that's my first innovative update for you this evening. Johnson County Community College is the first in the state and one of the few across the country to join Internet 2. You might ask, what is Internet 2? It's simply a combination of the Internet and cloud. Suffice it to say, we're one of the few and the only one in the state at the moment that are using, uh, that are using Internet 2, which is a new platform <coughs> that allows us to make the best of the Internet and cloud services. 
and we've joined those two together, and we have accomplished that with our technical teams. More to come on that, you'll see more, but just suffice to say that is a very innovative and uh, quite a, a, a vast and good accomplishment for the college. So that's number one. We should be excited about that. Um, hold your applause. Um, <laughs> number two, self uh, <laughs> password reset, self-service password reset has allowed us to allow for uh, folks to just Passwords reset on their own makes it easy. It's very common. It's very practical. That's another major initiative we, we've accomplished. We're, we have uh, definitely uh, upped the game in security. You've heard a lot about it. You're going to hear a lot more about it. But we have uh, fairly advanced, somewhat artificial intelligence uh, level uh, working for us in, in advanced threat protection these days. AccuCampus is something you've heard a lot about. You just approved an expenditure uh, earlier tonight with Engineerica. That is a major system deployment. We've got it in 21 centers and more to come on that. I will not go through all the centers. Suffice it to say, though, that tracks resources across the campus and it allows students to swipe uh, to engage, more or less. Uh, gives us lots of rich data. We're going to use that for great benefits with uh, Randy's team and, and, um, and Mickey's folks. A lot more to come on that as well. We have, uh, uh, you're going to be seeing in management committee a presentation in our technical uh, service center. And support center, sorry, and uh, we're going to be talking about our increased utilization of students and the way we deploy those students in not just our technical support slash help desk, but across the campus in our labs. How am I doing? Just about done. Active learning classrooms, we're around 12 at the moment, and then on top of that, about eight learning studios, so that's fantastic. Great feedback on that, and uh, again, you'll hear a lot more about it. Something that ties back to a couple meetings ago where you heard about the TACT grant, that has produced our, what we call our Net Labs. Net Labs are an incredible resource for our students. It gives them a virtual uh, remote access to do all of what used to be on hardware switching environments, all done virtually now. And that Net Lab is a direct result of that tech grant. We're expanding that to basically support and build out the, uh, the Cisco Academy, uh, which supports all of our Cisco programs, certifications, and security. Big data programs, we're definitely moving into the data science uh, area for certifications in that space. We are continuing to reinvent that and make that a much more effective and cloud-hosted environment for big data classes. And we're giving Wi-Fi and hotspot capabilities to our dental truck. What do you call that, Mickey? Our, our mobile... Uh, Denebago. There we go. <laughs> we're, we're making it Wi-Fi enabled, so uh, all good to go. And lastly, we're looking at a, what are uh, considered cloud-based virtual environment processing for the future of our campus. Uh, that means less desktops and more things that work in that cloud across that a whole I2 thing that I was telling you about earlier. And uh, I think I'll just wrap on that. I do, I do want to say, we did, uh, we're, I think we're doing a collaboration now with NASA. Is that correct? That's what I heard, yes. Okay. Uh, coincidentally, uh, we received a podium for NASA, and apparently NASA received ours. Is that true, that Adrian? Hurt. So I don't know whether that's something I don't know about. A true story. <laughs> that is a true story. We ordered a podium, and uh, they ordered a podium, and somehow uh, it got mixed up. So we are. A NASA podium? We got a NASA podium right now. Uh, it's, and uh, yeah, so uh, I'm trying to make that work for another innovative project, Joe. I don't know the angle on that yet, though. We should keep it because it's probably a lot more expensive just than what saying. we were. So uh, just, I'll end on that since the whole Mars thing's going on right now. A couple now. things, Tom. Yes. I, I, I'd like the board to know when Tom started, we had zero students. You know, we're about opportunities for students here in Access. We had zero students working in IES. That put us in last place when we looked at our peer institutions. <clears throat> Under Tom's leadership, we're now up to 14, which is terrific. It's and then also, experience. Tom, um, access control. What was the high for access control and about how, how much progress have we, have we made? Where are we now as far as numbers of people who, were, who had access? Uh, we, we had, uh, we had uh, up into the three, almost 4,000 level of uh, folks that had access to various um, uh, uh, doors and other other you know hard, key, hard hard hardware keys as well as, as as key fobs and all that that sort of thing. We had thousands, four thousand plus uh, folks that had access to various things. We have now dropped that down to under a thousand in terms of the way we give that access. That doesn't mean that um, that many people had inappropriate access. It just means that we are more effectively using that. And, and when I say thousands, I should say groups 
groups of people. It's just the way we configure the system. So we've just simplified and allowed uh, for more secure and easy access to a variety of. Thank you, Tom. So. Uh, did you get Roberta's keys? I bet you probably you probably still have access here to some room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're faking it. I know you do. I know you do. Okay, that's great, Tom. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Two minutes of the first half. That was. <laughs> two minutes of the first half. I want to take this evening and uh, the opportunity to uh, highlight a couple of uh, the work of a couple of our data and research analysts. There's a handout at your sheet or at your seat. Uh, we're going to look at the non-colorful side first, uh, looking at some. Uh, research that Jeff Delaroy, a new research analyst in our office, has been working on. Jeff came to us with a background in meteorology, so trying to do weather and climate predictions is where his background's in. He's taken that and leveraged that into using that science behind that into looking at our student enrollment and trying to predict what our enrollment is or what it will be in, in the future. Um, so in front of you, there's uh, some of the models that he did. I'm not going to go into the science behind this. Uh, we did had him come in and present to cabinet, and all their eyes glassed over, and they just kind of looked at me like, uh, really? Um, but there, there's an amazing science behind this. So there's three different models, and then you can combine those models into what they call ensembles to try to do predictions. 60 days out, Jeff was 34 students off with one of his models. That's phenomenal. That, that's really phenomenal. What I've challenged Jeff with is to start looking at other things outside of these models that may be influencing that so that we can try to do better predictions for budgeting process. Um, specifically looking at like the unemployment rate and how does that affect different groups of our students so that a year out we can try to start looking at what should our enrollment be? Can, will we be expecting that next, next economic downturn and how much of it will lag be in enrollment. So those are things that we're working on for the future. But um, this is the first time in my 20 plus year career in higher education that we've been able to predict enrollment within 34 students. So I'm, I'm very, proud, very proud of the work that Jeff's done. So that's the first thing. Second thing, flip it over on the back. This is a new dynamic report that uh, the institutional research has been working on. Mark Gordon out of the institutional research office. Uh, did the design on this report. Um, and uh, Chief Russell, this is the uh, traffic report that you have leveraged and used. Um, historically, we created a static report that looked at where our students were at across campus by building. Mark has taken that data and made it into a dynamic report that gets updated every night. And so we know when students drop a class, the next morning we can say less students are actually in this building. And so this is actually looking at the, a heat map of that report that Chief Russell can now go out instead of having it static, he can go out and dynamically look at this and know exactly how many students are in a particular building at a particular time of day. Um, Chief, I think you've used this to be, do some of your deployment with some of your officers um, it, and uh, be, be able to do some better community policing around that. Some of the other areas that's used it, custodial maintenance has used this to better deploy and better have better coverage at different times of the day looking at this. Uh, food services have used this for some of their staffing patterns in, in open office um, or open services times. And I just got another request today to give access to Randy's area in, in student life and activities. Um, they discovered this report existed and they want to be able to use it to determine where better to hand out flyers and hang flyers around campus based on traffic patterns of students. So it's, it's really phenomenal. You notice there that our highest traffic times as we expect is between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m during the day. So um, just, just some really new, exciting reports that's coming out of the Institutional Research Office. I think I'm, I'm getting close on time. I got two, two more things I want to talk about. Um, out of the Assessment Office, uh, we have partnered with the um, Faculty Development Office to help develop the curriculum for a summer teaching institute for our faculty here at JCCC. Um, really great collaborative process. It'll be a two-day seminar. Um, for teaching and learning for full-time faculty. Um, the curriculum is going to consist of how do you teach, talk, talking about such things as learning strategies, student engagement, um, active and experimental learning. How do you know it's working, which is really where the assessment office comes in on this and is looking at the cycle of assessment, assessment toolbox, Bloom's taxonomy, and then what impacts your teaching. So this is looking at things outside of the actual classroom, such as technology, diversity, inclusion, different generations, how do they learn? Service learning. What other resources exist at JCCC? Um, 
so there, that's going on. It's a, a new thing that's coming up starting this summer. The last thing in the assessment office is the assessment by design, um, which is a, a summer workshop based focused on assessment. Um, this was originally developed strictly for our JCCC faculty. Um, this workshop provides practical uh, look and hands-on look at the assessment cycle and how they can integrate that within their classroom and within their program review processes at the college. Um, workshop started as face-to-face -face offering last year. Sherry and her team developed this into an online format and actually started marketing this not just nationally but internationally. Um, so we've had uh, participants attend from Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, Wyoming, Arkansas, Minnesota, and the Bahamas, our international presence. Um, so this, this curriculum is not just for community colleges, it's actually designed for both two-year and four-year institutions. Um, so uh, this is part of fulfilling our vision for the college of becoming an international or national leader in higher education. Um, lastly, I wanted to mention that uh, Sherry and her team are also putting on a regional assessment conference. Uh, in April, their keynote speaker is Dr. Jeremy Penn, who's the president of the Association for the Assessment of Learning in Higher Education. And the pre-conference pre workshop will be on April 25th. The conference is on April 26th on a Friday. They currently have 15 proposals that have been accepted for multiple breakout sessions. So that concludes my report. Thank you, John. Yep. All right, Chris. I'll attempt to stay in two minutes since my here. <laughs> a little do it in 30. <laughs> I told Terry 60 to 75, so we'll see how it goes. So two quick things we're going to point out today. First thing, a lot of people have opinions on marketing. They think it's a lot of art, words, designs. It's probably one of the most opinionated um, areas you can be in because everybody is an expert within marketing. So what we've tried to do over the past two years is really bring a lot of science to the marketing. So how are things performing? So we can say, not based on your opinion, but based on actual results. So for the past two years, we've been trying to create a holistic marketing dashboard that shows not just web, but digital, social, um, actual content, words that are being used, everything that we deploy um, in the landscape how is that performing? And two weeks ago, we were actually able to launch this dashboard, so it's used internally. So we can monitor not only what words are being affected, what ads are being affected, um, how we're performing against competitors. This is all done real time. I, I say a lot, and I actually spoke in cabinet, the advertising is like the stock market. This allows us to essentially play the stock market and in real time change our ads, change our words, be more effective and more efficient on our spend and what we deploy, when we deploy, and how we deploy. And the most important thing is it allows us to prove the ROI off of it. So we can now gauge, did this work? Did it not work? Why did it work? Why does it not? Um, we hear a lot. I approach marketing a little bit different. It's not this big broadcast. We have billboards, but um, we do a ton of targeting. So we niche target individuals based on age, based on gender, based on interest, based on their patterns on the web. So at any point in time, actually yesterday, we had, I believe it was 39 different ads placed on the internet. We had another 45 different ads placed on social media. And every single one of these were targeted to specific niche groups. So a lot of us don't even see it because we're not who we're targeting. And this allows us to understand if it works or not. The second thing we're working on is we're actually looking to relaunch the website, jccc.edu, January 14th. Um, this has been a long time coming. This has been done internally, um, which has been a heavy lift, not just for marketing, but also for Tom's group with NIS. Um, normally, this is farmed out to, to different agencies to assist with this, and this is something I was adamant that I wanted to be done in-house. In um, this is a complete overhaul, and it's based off a year and a half of data based off of user experience. This isn't opinion. This isn't an instructor wanted this, and I wanted that, and we mesh it all together, and we push it out there. This is based off of real user's data to allow us to better engage students, better engage communities, make it become a resource, make it become reliable, and most importantly, make it become actionable. That's Anything great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you who have seen our advertising on, I, on I-35, and uh, I think it's I-635, uh, that's all Chris's fault. We had nothing to do with that. So if you get complaints from other schools, you can call Chris up. So, and that wraps up our report. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sopcich. Uh, Faculty Association, Dr. Harvey. Hello. <laughs> I brought some artwork with me today. I'll explain in a second. Uh, I wouldn't really call it artwork. That's, no, but... 
I'll explain why I, why I brought this with me. Um, well, first I just wanted to say how uh, proud I am of our very eloquent and bold and assertive um, student speakers that we heard tonight. I think that um, it just shows the caliber of students that we have here in our student leaders. And um, I also share their concerns um, as the, my students in my classroom, uh, so many of them struggle. Uh, financially, and that is part of why they're here, is trying to better their lives, and um, this is a place that is an affordable um, place for them to come and just find a new career or find a first career. Um, and, and I think I made a lot of comments last time about minimum wage not changing and those sorts of things. So um, I did want to talk a little bit tonight about uh, just a couple of things that sort of brought people together recently. Um, so the first one is the holiday giving tea. Um, I don't know how many of you got a, ch got a chance to be a part of that or see it, but it was uh, for the 50th, they paired our students um, JCCC gives with the uh, annual holiday tea. And it was really cool. Um, there were students and faculty and staff and administrators and board members all coming together and um, doing something to help a, a number of people. Um, if you weren't there, there, was, there were donations for the food pantry for our students. Um, there were cards written for veterans and, um, and tons of gifts. And I'm, I do wanna thank uh, Trustee Lawson for picking up all of those uh, tags and bringing them to one of our faculty association meetings and passing them out to people uh, because it did help us because for some reason there is this uh, barrier, getting yourself over to the place where the tree is with the tags uh, is a barrier to overcome. So it was nice to have those available. And, you know, the needs of our students, I mean, when you see them, you know, colleagues were taking uh, tags that said, you know, formula for their kid. And um, there were ones for shoes for kids and um, jeans and things like that. So it was, it, it's very, um, eye-opening too when you just see what kinds of needs our students have, but it was really amazing to have everybody come together and get to be a part of, of blessing some of our students um, at this time of the year. Uh, we also got to hear from the jazz groups here on campus, um, and you know there was great food and it was a lot of fun. So I just wanted to say something about that. Um, today I got to attend something that's been happening uh, every month called Tasting Thursdays. And it was put on uh, in part from the faculty development, but it's called Dining Across Disciplines. And it was a partnership between the culinary um, program and Aaron, uh, Chef Aaron Prater in particular put this together with a number of faculty across different disciplines. And so he's partnered with history, he's partnered with science, um, today he partnered with interior design. And um, Professor Darla Green, for, with our interior design program, she gave a little lesson on, um, on elements of design and sort of relayed, the, related them to gingerbread houses and gingerbread house decoration. And, um, and so anyways, uh, we got to make gingerbread houses. Um, Chef Pray, this is mine. Yeah. Oh, you, oh, you like to see it? Okay, sure. It's it's quite a, a, a impressive piece of work, I'm sure. But at any rate, um, so she she talked about design. She showed us some models that her students had done. She had given them the assignment of of designing a, a gingerbread house out of, it was out of paper, it was just a, a mock-up design. Um, but Chef Prater, he fed us uh, gingerbread snaps and homemade eggnog, and it was kind of amazing. And so if, as the, if those continue in the future, I encourage folks um, in our community <laughs> to, um, to participate as they can. But I think it just shows, um, you know, when we connect interdisciplinary, when we connect across our programs, when we come together and do things, we can, we can do some pretty cool things here in this campus. And I think that's what I love most about a community college is the way that we can 
interact with various disciplines. And um, so I just wanted to highlight how some of my colleagues have been taking things in their areas and combining them with other areas and making connections for folks because things like design, elements of design, things in science, all of those are important to students in culinary, for example. And so um, it was a mix of, of staff and faculty and, um, and some students there today, and it was kind of fun. So that's really all I wanted to share, just a couple of highlights. It's the end of the semester. I'm giving a final tomorrow, and we're starting to see the end of the, of the tunnel. And um, so I, I think all of our students are ready for a well-deserved uh, break. And, that concludes my report. This is the second reference tonight that Trustee Lawson was an effective uh, Santa's helper. Karen, do, do we have a workforce development Santa's helper class? Uh, I don't, how did you get so I um, could probably find some <laughs> listings out there for that, yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Melody. Melody, appreciate it very much. Uh, good luck with your finals and uh, I think we have an executive session. We might want to leave that. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Harvey. Uh, Johnson may, County Education. May I make a quick comment on that? Because I think what, what Nellie talked about on her student needs, I, I, I hope faculty share those kind of stories with the foundation, which is our primary effort right now, of helping those students with those specific needs. And so that we can all on the campus work to raise more scholarship monies and grant monies, those need monies, so that we can help those ones you described that are looking for shoes for their kids or whatever. So, so that we have those, those stories help raise money from people. So if we can share those and, and be more than anecdotal, I think that helps us all raise money so those students can get help. Thank you. Johnson County Research Triangle, uh, there's no report. Uh, Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, Trustee Ingram. Okay, um, I will just pick out some highlights from our meeting. We had a quarterly meeting on December the 2nd and 3rd at Independence Community College. Don Ash from Kansas City, Kansas Community College provided a report on the recent ACCT Leadership Congress in New York City. He is stepping down as our state coordinator and reminded those in attendance of the importance of maintaining a presence at both the state and national level. Uh, Colby trustee Arlen Liker has indicated interest in serving as state coordinator and will meet with his college board to discuss participation. So that's a really important position on that board. Executive Director Linda Fun shared she is in the process of finalizing plans for the legislative reception at the National Legislative Summit, which will be held in February in DC. And I believe we have a couple of trustees that are going to be attending. The reception for the legislators and those attending the summit will be held on February 12th from 6 to 7 p.m., but there will be more information forthcoming about that. Linda also reminded everyone of the new date for Phi Theta Kappa in Topeka, again, is on March the 7th, and details, again, will be announced about that. Linda also provided an update on the Public Relations and Marketing Council, which is being reinstituted. She is worth working with all 19 community colleges and their marketing departments to coordinate information. So we appreciate your work, I'm sure, Chris, on that. Um, the big piece of information is that Linda, our executive director, has announced her retirement, which is going to be effective the end of April. So she met with the executive committee and will focus on assisting in putting together a job description. Uh, there was a treasurer's report, which provided a financial review of the budget. Uh, it was noted that the financials do not include November of 2018 and that all the revenues, uh, the revenues included the dues payment of all 19 community colleges. Um, Executive Director Linda Fun also provided a review of Legislative Research's 2018-2019 Appropriations Report. The main thing that she discussed there was um, obviously expenditures are expected to increase, and it was noted particularly that universities as well as community colleges are now targeting the same student populations, which really comes as no surprise to many of us. Um, also regarding Senate Bill 155, universities are shifting to dual enrollment in high schools and there is an increase in distant, distance education that she was reminding of, us of. Uh, she shared that while revenues are good through the state, there will not be much extra money. So that's pretty consistent with what we've already heard this evening. Um, the executive committee has begun conversations about the role and responsibilities in order to fill Linda's director uh, position. 
and they will be including um, several presidents. I believe Dr. Sopcich is planning to participate in that. Um, so all are invited to share any, any, kind of, any kind of input that you might have regarding that position. So that concludes my brief report. Thank you, Trustee Ingram. Foundation, Trustee Ingram. Back to the foundation. Um, I'm sorry that Kate Allen is not here this evening to thank her for another great year with the foundation. They are currently accepting nominations for new board members. The board development committee will meet after the first of the year to evaluate can candidates for the 2019-2020 board slate. This process will conclude with a vote on the slate at the foundation's April board meeting. The foundation also is currently accepting nominations for the 2019 Johnson County Inn of the Year. The intent of this award is to recognize someone who has made significant contributions to the Johnson County community as well as the college. Nominations are due to the foundation by January 15th, and a selection committee will review all submissions. Recommendations may be brought to the foundation office or emailed directly to Kate. Uh, the foundation would like to close by thanking the trustees and cabinet members for their efforts to make 2018 such a great year. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Any Welcome. questions of Trustee Ingram? Uh, the next item is the consent agenda. Uh, uh, the agenda item where we deal with a lot of routine items, uh, unless someone is uh, interested in taking an item off of the consent agenda for further discussion, I'll entertain a motion to approve such. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Any discussion? Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying no. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. We do have an executive session this evening, and I would like to entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of reviewing and discussing safety and security information and best practices pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act, exception relating to security measures to ensure the security of the college, its buildings and or its systems are not jeopardized. I'd like to invite Joe Sopcich, Barbara Larson, Terry Schlich, Tanya Wilson, Chris Gray, Greg Russell, Michael Marchese, uh, and Alyssa Pacer to join the executive session. It'll be for 30 minutes. I would like to entertain a motion. So moved. Uh, Ingram Second. moves and uh, cross seconds. We will, uh, we will start the executive session at 7.20, at seven minutes from now. Thank you. The board is out of executive session. We are now back in open session. No action was taken. I would entertain a motion for adjournment. Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you.